Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Simon Jackman. I'm Professor of Political Science and Chief Executive Officer of the United States Studies Center at the University of Sydney. And with the generosity of Bloomberg News providing us access with this magnificent space, um, the United States Study Center is delighted to be hosting uh, an address from Australia's Foreign Minister, Senator the Honorable Maurice Payne. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. It's upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney has built, but so too the Sydney CBD and this building for that matter. Before introducing the minister, let me acknowledge the presence of the Consul General of Japan with us tonight, Mr. Masahiko Kia. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, and we're delighted to have two of the board of directors from the United States Study Center with us tonight, uh, Professor Stephen Garten, Senior Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University. Thank you, Stephen. And John Robinson, Managing Partner at Ernst Young. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support of the United States Study Center. And it's also a great pleasure to see so many friends and supporters of the Centre here tonight, spending government, academia, and our students as well, business, media, and civil society. And I especially thank Chris Jenkins from Talos uh, for their support of the United States Study Centre. Chris is here tonight as well. Thank you, Chris. And since I won't have the opportunity later, let me uh, thank the events team at the United States Centre, the hardest working events team in town, Janine Pinto and Mara Gonzalez. Thank you so much. The mission of the United States Study Centre is to educate Australians about the United States and about Australia's relationship with the United States, and we do that through teaching, through academic and think tank facing research, and like tonight's event, engagement with political leaders and policymakers, the business community, and the lay public. The Centre's mission has never been more relevant for at least two reasons, both of which present challenges to the formulation and conduct of Australian foreign policy and our sense of place in the world. First, China's economic rise is seeing the Chinese state accrue the resources necessary to assert itself regionally, if not globally, and rapid and induce rapid geostrategic change in the Indo-Pacific. And as a consequence, Australia's neighbourhood and Australia itself has perhaps never been as strategically significant, perhaps at any time, since World War II, a state of affairs that was not so as recently as only a decade ago. Second, Australia's best and closest ally, the United States, is engaged in a very open, very public and sometimes quite fractious debate about its role in the world, a uh, relentless self-interrogation about the costs and benefits of leadership of the international rules-based order it helped build. And so together, those two developments mean that there has never been a more exciting time to be at the United States Study Center, to use a form of words from an earlier era. Uh, something that I know is a tremendous motivation for myself and for my team. What an opportunity we have, and indeed what a responsibility we have, and what a privilege it is to be charged with supplying rigorous evidence-based contributions to the national conversation about finding our way in this fast-moving world. At the United States Study Center, our regular engagements with policymakers in Canberra and Washington mean that we are well aware of the stakes involved for Australia. And so, if it's an incredibly stimulating time for us, spare a thought for those charged with the carriage of Australian foreign policy, starting with, of course, Minister Payne. The title of the minister's speech tonight, Ensuring Security Enabling Prosperity, neatly encapsulates the myriad challenges and opportunities facing Australia in its dealings with other nations and outlines the mindset guiding Australia's approach to these matters. I'm confident that tonight's speech from the Minister will join major addresses by the Minister and the Prime Minister in making clear Australia's rationale for its international priorities and the policies designed to see them through. The United States Study Centre is therefore especially pleased to be hosting this particular speech by the Minister. Minister Payne has held portfolios with a national security focus now for just over four years, serving as Minister for, Fence, for Defence for three years, in which time she oversaw the delivery of an important defence white paper and the creation of a $200 billion initiative in improving Australia's stock and the acquisition chain for defence material. Minister Payne is a Sydney local, or a Sydney Basin local, a graduate of the New South Wales, no one's perfect, and the first woman to become <laughs> president of the National Young Liberals. 
Um, she entered Parliament in 1997, and prior to her service as Minister for Defence, she was Minister for Human Services in the Abbott government. Senator Payne has been Australia's Foreign Minister since August of 2008 and Minister for Women since May of this year. Minister, we look forward to your address. Some Q&A up here afterwards. I'll join you for after that. But ladies and gentlemen, the Foreign Minister, Senator, the Honourable Maurice Payne. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and let me also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet here this evening and pay my respects to their elders past, present uh, and emerging. Simon, thank you very much for your warm introduction. Uh, to you as the CEO of the US Studies Centre and to Bloomberg and Managing Editor Ed Johnson, thank you for hosting us here tonight. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to uh, the United States Studies Centre. I also have to thank you for your forbearance with my schedule. Uh, it is uh, fair to say that uh, if uh, there is an honours degree available at the University of Sydney in patience, then uh, Simon is a very good candidate. Uh, and uh, I very much appreciate uh, that understanding. Tonight, uh, Sydney, tomorrow Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, again, one of those weeks. I very much appreciate it. May I also acknowledge uh, our two United States Studies Centre board members who are here tonight, Stephen Garten, who is, of course, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney, and John Rob Robinson, the managing partner at uh, Ernst & Young. And I see dotted throughout the room a few friendly faces, which is very nice, uh, and some members of the media. You're very, very good to see you here as well, all of you. <laughs> I want to uh, talk briefly also about the United States Studies Centre because I do think that a centre of this nature plays a vital role in informing Australians about the United States and about Australia's relationship with the United States. The centre has a solid track record of producing reports on issues ranging from the Alliance to Indo-Pacific security and global trade issues that raise the level of the public conversation in Australian foreign policy. I congratulate Simon and your team on that excellent work. And I thank you very much for giving us Melissa McIntosh. <laughs> Ensuring security uh, and enabling prosperity. They are interdependent and they are mutually reinforcing. Australia has been a secure and prosperous nation for decades. Culturally, socially, economically, physically, and politically. We've been secure within a system of alliances, partnerships, collective security arrangements and international institutions that we have helped to shape. And we have prospered within a system of international rules and norms that have served to protect our interests and support our values. But we have now well and truly entered a period in which we cannot be complacent about these rules, norms and institutions. We cannot simply hope or expect them to continue to evolve in ways that support our interests. The various strata of international cooperation won't have the same moorings they've had for the past several generations. We see now and we can expect to continue seeing a rising volume of contributions from a wider range of actors. We need, therefore, to be very clear about the values and the long-term interests that will serve as our guides. Australia's prosecution of a strong foreign policy that means we are actively out in the world, modernising the international system, is perhaps more important now than it has ever been. We are energetic in shaping our region and helping improve the international system of rules to keep them fit for purpose and supportive of our national interests. We work collaboratively, creatively and flexibly with others who have similar visions for our region. It's important that we discuss these challenges and our responses and I welcome the opportunity to do that here tonight. It is clear, as the Prime Minister and I have laid out in successive speeches and public statements, that the international system does need to modernise if it's to reflect the principles that we regard as being beneficial to Australia and also to all nations. 
Australians are very interested and alert to the extent to which our circumstances are changing. Our foreign policy is an expression of who we are and it's a way of shaping our international environment to make it possible for us to continue being who we are. We are in, as Simon alluded to, a period of renewed major power rivalry. But that is not the only issue that will challenge us. Right across the globe, shifts in economic and strategic weight, overlaid by the impact of fast-moving technology, are producing dramatic changes in political attitudes and fortunes. This dynamic and complex environment offers opportunities for newly empowered actors. A broader range of actors now wield influence globally, for better or for worse, including nation states, non-state groups, including terrorist organisations, multinational corporations, mega cities, and even individuals. Sovereign states, though, remain the building blocks of the international system and have unique responsibilities. But non-state actors are assuming greater relevance in this new strategic landscape. We will also be engaging with a different post-Brexit Britain and Europe. We continue to grapple with ongoing insecurity and instability in the Middle East, with a revanchist Russia intent on disruption and with an increasingly assertive and influential China. Trade tensions are symptomatic of stress within vital international institutions, underscoring the need for reform. Sources and loci of power are changing, shifting us a long way from the bipolar world of the Cold War. The US has made it quite clear that it is assessing what proportion of the burden it shoulders for maintaining the international system. Many of these dynamics are connected. To continue to be secure and prosperous, we must adapt to these evolving circumstances. And I am strongly of the view that such adaptation requires being true to our values and our principles. This consistency is the only way to ensure that Australia remains strong and influential in the changing international environment. We have to start by ensuring that our values are reflected in the international rules and institutions in which we are participants. This is a quite different time to 1945. Then when the international community led by the United States came together amid the ashes of World War II to establish the United Nations and develop the system of rules and norms that have essentially underpinned peace and prosperity for the last 75 years. Today what we face is an increasingly contested international order with a very crowded field of players all vying to declare what is fair and what is right. And finding consensus is increasingly difficult. That's why countries such as Australia will continue to step up and help to marshal international support to evolve rules that will keep necessary economic competition from tipping into dangerous conflict and preserve many of our cherished principles. In gathering international support, Australia engages energetically and persuasively to help build coalitions of states, incorporating regional countries and like-minded nations globally that share our interests in a stronger and more effective international order. At a time of rapid change, we do need an international system that preserves the unique characteristics of individual states while supporting their agency in addressing global issues. Member states are the elements that comprise the international system and therefore we can and should shape it to serve our interests. We intend to shape it positively to ensure it reflects our own character and interests, is contemporary and enables focused and practical action to address common challenges. That means modernising of some of the institutions that make up the global order and some of the rules to keep pace with changes in technology, in trade and in the global strategic balance. 
it can be done. The reform, recently, of the Universal Postal Union is a timely example. Australia worked with a number of other countries to modernise the organisation, to make delivery costs, including for our own Australia Post, more equitable. Instead of seeing this essential international system fall apart after 145 years, with key members just walking away, it was preserved and strengthened. It is important for us to prioritise our efforts in terms of pursuing reform of institutions that are most relevant to Australia's interests. So we will continue working positively with existing international and regional architecture, such as ASEAN and the East Asian Summit, to ensure that we can together address regional security challenges more effectively. We'll work with the Indian Ocean Rim Association as its importance grows as well. And importantly, we'll continue to participate actively in the development and codification of the rules and norms for the game-changing domains of space and cyberspace and position ourselves to optimise the benefits and mitigate the risks arising from a literal explosion of new technologies. Hyperconnectivity already has a profound effect on almost everything we do. Increasingly, the distinction between our online and our offline lives is disappearing. Here and now, tonight, I'm sure we are live streaming, we are tweeting, we are texting, we are WhatsApping. You may be signalling. You have so many new verbs to choose from and nouns, whoever knew. But that hyperconnectivity is inescapable. Critical technologies are changing the foreign and security policy landscape. Technologies like artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, 5G, Cyber capabilities, blockchain and quantum computing are emerging as key strategic resources and the focus of intensified geopolitical competition. There is a new politics of technology around the differences between allowing new technology to liberate and enable human creativity and individualism and the use of it to surveil and reduce the space of individuals to express themselves and to share their views. And that's even before I get to the malevolent use of technology on and against individuals, on cohorts of communities and so on. With radically different approaches emerging across the globe on the use of these technologies and the possible implications for surveillance, for censorship, for privacy and economic benefit, governments need to carefully but frankly, without delay, evolve their strategic thinking about these issues. Many countries are starting to grapple with how these new transformational tools are governed and regulated, what principles and ethics they should follow, and ultimately what role they will play in the geopolitical and the economic landscape. Western liberal democracies cannot be silent or absent from this debate will be affected by the rapid pace of change. We are affected by the rapid pace of change, whether we like it or not. And so we must continue to act in the interests of our public and in the sovereignty of our nations. Australia has worked hard to ensure that the rules-based international order applies equally online as it does offline. We are well positioned, thought by many, uh, seen by many as a world thought leader on international cyber engagement, and I have to say, led by our inaugural ambassador for cyber affairs, Dr. Toby Feakin. Last month, I launched a joint statement, uh, co-launched a joint statement on advancing responsible state behaviour in cyberspace with my US and Dutch colleagues at the UN General Assembly Leaders Week. This is clear recognition that the international rules-based order should guide state behaviour in cyberspace and the interest and the engagement in such an initiative is only growing. If we don't, we risk encouraging those who seek to misuse cyberspace as a means of repression of control and instability. As a member of the community of responsible cyber operators, it's now time to build on that base and to broaden our engagement to ensure that the rapidly maturing technology environment doesn't undermine the rules-based international order. The era of cyber and tech diplomacy 
is well and truly also upon us. And Australia will continue to work with like-minded partners to ensure that our technological destiny reflects the values of our society, protects our most vulnerable, and ensures a prosperous economic future. There are indeed genuine risks to human rights if we don't create better rules and norms for the digital world. And while critical technologies are no doubt changing our way of life and exacerbating threats and opportunities, we have to continue to deal with them while we are maintaining our own fundamental principles of individual freedoms and rights, and while we are focused on security and prosperity, whether online or off. It is the case that countries that respect and promote their citizens' rights at home tend also to be better international citizens. Those whose governments are less accountable to their people, uh, those governments who are accountable to their people, I'm sorry, are less likely to cause their own people unnecessary suffering through reckless actions abroad. They are less prone to corruption and better placed to foster innovation and business confidence and therefore consequently more economically productive. They do produce wealthier societies with higher standards of living. And ultimately, when you are able to generate your own wealth, you don't need to take it from others. Democracy, individual rights and freedoms therefore flow through to international principles that produce stronger relations between countries. Principles like respect for international law, peaceful settlement of disputes, collective solutions to shared problems, a commitment to working cooperatively according to a set of rules. There will be exceptions, but overwhelmingly, free and self-governed people behave better towards each other and the rest of the world. Australia recognises the sovereignty of nations. We don't interfere in other countries' political systems. The best way for Australia to lead, therefore, is to be an example to others. That means trading freely and fairly, pulling our weight to maintain a stable and prosperous region, not standing idly by when other countries are coerced speaking honestly and consistently about human rights. Speaking our minds does not constitute interference in another country. That's why we've used our current membership of the Human Rights Council to raise concerns about human rights violations in, for example, Saudi Arabia, including the murder in Turkey of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi. It is why we've made the plight of Rohingya people forced to flee from Rakhine State in Myanmar, a human rights priority in our own region. It's why we've released a national strategy for the worldwide abolition of the death penalty. We've also raised our concerns about the treatment of Uyghur people in Xinjiang in China. And I will continue to advocate strongly for fair and transparent treatment for Australians overseas. For example, Dr Yang Jun in China who should receive the protections afforded by international human rights law. Similarly, we've spoken clearly and publicly on the need for Jock Paul Freeman to receive due process under the rule of law in Bulgaria, and for that not to be influenced by external factors outside the operation of the rule of law. We will not surprise any country by advocating consistently for human rights. We do do that. It will remain part of our conversations, including with China, as our relationship with our comprehensive strategic partner continues to evolve. We will remain constructive and respectful. As both the Prime Minister, including I suspect in this room, if I remember uh, correctly, and I have made clear, we welcome the economic rise of China. We recognise this as a great and historic achievement. We acknowledge that as a major power, China will seek influence regionally and globally. At the same time, we are able to be clear about our differences with China. We are an open democracy. China is a communist party state. We have different economic, political and cultural systems and values. As the Prime Minister has said, we will always make 
our decisions in Australia's national interest, and China will make their decisions in their national interest, as you would expect. But we open up scope for cooperation on common interests, making progress in the areas that benefit both of us. That there are different values between us is a fact. That we can work together in mutually beneficial ways is similarly a fact. As well as our comprehensive strategic partnership, we enjoy an economic relationship that is growing. We hold regular productive meetings at high levels. We'll manage our differences. We'll take every opportunity to cooperate where we can and where it is in our national interest. Our national interest requires advocacy through pr pr private diplomacy and appropriate public mechanisms. We must respect each other's sovereignty but we will consistently continue to raise issues such as human rights, including, as I have said, with China. We will do so not just because we believe that individual rights should apply to all people, but because we believe that nations that uphold such principles domestically are more likely to cooperate in ways that promote the common good globally. Turning a blind eye to all human rights violations means an acceptance of behaviour that undermines the foundations of international peace and stability. Where there is no challenge, there is no progress. Our long-term interests depend on our taking a firm stand, even if it displeases some of our counterparts, some other countries in the short term. To help maintain an international system that is in accordance with our values and our long-term interests, we are also deepening our engagement with regional and like-minded powers. We also recognise that in this era of strategic change, the US alliance is more important to us than ever. Our relationship with the United States is firmly fixed in our history and our values across successive governments and leaders on both sides of the Pacific. It's the case that some Australians will query the approaches taken at times by the current administration. Let me simply say this though. The United States has a record unmatched in modern times of leading an international system aimed at benefiting all people, not just its own precisely because it has built a reputation over many decades as a country that looks to express its power internationally for the broader good, we reflexively look to the United States to take responsibility when there is a problem. That is still the case. The world has high expectations of the superpower. And we still need their focused, deliberate and strategic engagement in our region. At times that will mean we must speak frankly with our powerful friend about how we work together to reassure others in the region and to build support for shared objectives. At the most recent Australia-United States Ministerial Meeting in Sydney in August, we outlined the shared goal of an increasingly networked structure of alliances and partnerships to maintain an Indo-Pacific that is secure, that is open and that is rules-based. At that OSMIN meeting, we agreed to create the Indo-Pacific Coordination Mechanism, a series of exchanges to improve our cooperation in the region. That proposal was then quickly formally taken up by Prime Minister Morrison and President Trump at the White House on the 20th of September, leading to the first engagement between senior officials from our two countries under the mechanism last week. The mechanism covers areas such as enhancing our security and defence cooperation, working together to meet the region's vast infrastructure and development needs, and coordinating on issues such as critical minerals. Critical infrastructure, critical technologies, critical minerals. These aren't emerging or future issues to be concerned with sometime down the track. These are key strategic issues that are right upon us and must be prioritised now. And Australia is enthusiastic about those discussions because we recognise that deep US strategic and economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific is vital to the region's security and prosperity. 
It's in our interests to deepen alliance cooperation to achieve the many political and strategic objectives that we share. Countries have traditionally looked to the United States not just because it has the mightiest military, but because they admire its democratic history and what that stands for. The real power of the US has always been the attractiveness of its ideas and the desire to share the way of life that those ideas enabled. The US's global network of political and military alliances deep within its system and within the systems of the allies, including Australia, is central to its national strength. It is unmatched by any country and it remains a global public good. But with the unipolar movement moment over, we can no longer expect the United States to bear the costs of global leadership on its own. We do therefore encourage all states that are committed to an open, inclusive, prosperous and secure region to do more to deliver on those goals, as we are and as we will. A region, uh, we will strive for a region that respects international law, where sovereignty prevails and where states are not subject to coercion. A region of open markets, where trade and investment relationships flourish and are based on rules. A region where disputes are settled peacefully, without the threat or the use of force. And a region where strong and resilient architecture helps all states, large and small, to protect their interests. In short, a region in which rules and cooperation, not might and power, are the dominant shapers. ASEAN, the East Asia Summit, they provide the foundations of our regional architecture. The Pacific Islands Forum, meanwhile, convenes our Pacific family. And Australia's stepped up engagement in the Pacific is taking place in close consultation with our Pacific partners and has the region's long-term development challenges, including climate change, central to our partnership. I met today with the uh, newly elected president of Nauru and reaffirmed Australia's commitment to regional security as it is set out under the Boy Declaration from last year's Pacific Island Forum. These existing groupings, they're joined in a way now by the Quad, which brings together four major democracies, Australia, the United States, India and Japan, to support rules and norms and regional resilience. I recently met with my counterparts from the Quad in New York, the first time this grouping has met at ministerial level. It confirmed our determination to deepen engagement, to set an example and to give confidence to others in the region. The Indian Ocean Rim Association, bringing together the key littoral and island states, completes the Indo-Pacific regional jigsaw. Australia is an active participant, a strong supporter of each of these institutions because they all help to frame a dialogue, a region where dialogue and rules, not power, predominate. Our overarching concern is the preservation of freedom and sovereignty in the Indo-Pacific. We continue to build a narrative from which others can draw reassurance, a narrative of prosperity, and security in the region, not making binary choices in a great power competition. The story is one of shared partnership in the pursuit of common goals. And each country can ask itself, what can we contribute? Ladies and gentlemen, while there's no doubt that recent years have brought increased global tensions from an increasing range of threats, both online and off, and from states looking to disrupt and coerce, to extremists seeking to terrorise. I do want to leave this evening with some positivity uh, in the interests of being glass half full, not half empty. The crises that have occurred, the challenges on Western liberal democracies, they've highlighted both the benefits of free, open, democratic societies as well as the fact that they are not inevitable. They take effort. They require vigilance. The protection of individual rights allows people to pursue their own economic opportunities 
enabling security allows countries and their citizens to make their own decisions, free from coercion and intimidation. That's the pathway to prosperity. This is a pivotal moment in history in which we see the uncertainty of strategic rivalry compounded by technological change. The decisions that we make now will affect generations to come. So we require the strength to prioritise long-term sovereignty, security and prosperity over short-term interests, not just for ourselves, not just for our regional partners, but indeed for the service of the values that Australia has enunciated for many decades now and continues to promulgate in the international community. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this evening and I look forward to uh, a discussion or some questions uh, with Professor Jackman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thanks for that. Um, Australian public opinion, Australian foreign policy has been on a journey. Um, for me, I contrast the Australian foreign policy white paper of 2017 with the Asian Century white paper not so long ago. Um, the, the, the speech you gave tonight, um, and, and like the foreign policy white paper, where uh, security, sovereignty, resilience are much more up towards the front of the speech and of the relevant documents than they say were in a document like the Asian Century White Paper from not that long ago, less than a decade ago. Um, and at various points tonight, you spoke about the difference, particularly right at the end there, sort of long-term gain, perhaps for short-term sacrifice, needed to ensure over the long haul we, we, we hang on to um, our values. Um, and, but the bigger arc here, though, is about the way foreign policy has come home to roost. About, about how threats like cyber are now not things that are happening to us out there, but are here. And so I'm, I'm trying to connect the dots here a little bit and, and see if I can draw you out on it. Is there a version of the near future where Australia goes above 2% of GDP, given that uncertainty you spoke about associated with strategic competition, where, and indeed, some, what forms might that short-term pain, if you will, in order to realise that long-term gain look like for those of us here at home in the spirit of foreign policy having to impose costs here on, on us locally? I think one of the uh, important things that um, government must do and must assure uh, the community that it does is to constantly review those settings. So yes, um, a defence white paper, foreign policy white paper, uh, launched within the same term of government and the foreign policy white paper, in fact, uh, filled a very long gap uh, mm -hmm. since there had been uh, such a document. They are foundational documents. There is no question of that. But what governments must do is to constantly and consistently review the settings that we take into the international community and, frankly, that we take into the domestic discussion. If we did not do that, and in some ways uh, I think uh, I was trying to point out with the uh, rapidity of uh, uh, change, uh, that, that, is, that is what we do do. Uh, and if we did not do that, we would be, uh, I think, complicit uh, in, in not ensuring we are prepared uh, for what lies ahead. Now, nobody, nobody, I don't care who says they do, has a crystal ball, not at least one that's functional. So with it, in the absence of that piece of technology, and I did ask the Defence Science and Technology Group <laughs> repeatedly to please produce it, uh, in the absence of that piece of technology, uh, in fact, I asked TALUS too, I think, Chris, from memory, uh, <laughs> that is what you have to do. And you do that by uh, constant engagement and uh, communication and work with our key partners our allies uh, and our counterparts uh, regionally and globally. You do that through engagement in the institutions uh, that, uh, that are part of the rules-based global order. You do that uh, by working with uh, key agencies. And we have 
uh, uh, from Australia's perspective, we have a very special uh, relationship, as you know, with our Five Eyes colleagues, our Five Eyes partners, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, are, are absolutely pivotal to ensuring that those conversations occur. So that review process occurs domestically, it occurs internationally, and governments make their policy settings based on constantly reviewing that. Um, I guess, though, I'm interested in how you bring the public along if the notion of short-term pain is in the offing um, and, and how that conversation works. Um, one of the things we encounter a lot as a US study centre is, you know, perhaps not people in this room, but people not in this room, um, the pace at which, say, official Australia, the things official Australia is saying about our relationship with China now are quite different to the things they were saying about it five six, seven years ago. But they must be said. Right. What else, what, of that, in that bucket of short-term pain that we may be looking at, what sort of things must we prepare the Australian public for, perhaps? Uh, well, um, again, back to the lack of a crystal ball. But uh, obviously you have to uh, prepare as much as you possibly can uh, for fissures uh, in... Uh, the international structures that are unexpected. So if you had asked um, the international community 10 years ago whether we expected to see the sort of engagement on trade issues that we are seeing between China and the United States mm -hmm. now in 2019, the international community would have said, well, no, no. Um, there may be some prescient individuals who, who may have said yes, but in the broad, they would have said no. So as we come closer to dealing with those sorts of, of challenges, uh, we have to be very clear uh, about uh, where we stand. And I think it was literally in this room, I think, where the Prime Minister indicated this is not about making binary choices, but it is about saying to the community, it is about saying uh, broadly that uh, we have two very important relationships here. Uh, one is uh, is based on um, all those aspects of uh, of history and engagement that I spoke about. The other is based in a more contemporary and newest comprehensive strategic partnership. They are very different relationships, and they are prosecuted very differently for that uh, for that reason. Uh, we are not the same as any other country in the Five Eyes. We are not the same as any other country in the world, and we will always prosecute that case according to Australia's national interests. And if you predicate uh, your responses on what might be short-term pain, as you have termed it, by always enunciating that as a government you are acting in Australia's national interests and explain that, uh, that premise, I think that is a, a very important starting point. Okay, fair enough. Let me, let me um, last one from me before we, a little bit of time for uh, questions from the audience. And for that reason, it'll be a bit of a two-parter. A little, <laughs> little less highfalutin and, and more in the in the US Australia bilateral, and that is, um, I know at the Palo Alto Osmin when you were still Defence Minister, uh, I know at the most recent Osmin here in, in Sydney, uh, this sort of chain of agreements between Australia and the US, one of them blossoming into a trilateral with Japan on on things not painted battleship grey in the Indo-Pacific, infrastructure, public health and, 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 and other things besides. Um, when or what or, or when um, will be the runs on the board there um, that you think we can, we can point to in the reasonably near term? Um, and moreover, might not I throw one on the, on the fire that, I, that I, I didn't hear in the speech tonight? And that is um, democracy promotion. Um, values suffuse through the speech as they do through any, I think, articulation of Australian foreign policy and its foundations at the moment. Um, and to be sure, there is what we would in academic circles call a fair amount of ideation uh, at work in the battle for hearts and minds here. To what extent that is part of the government's thinking, particularly in the suite of non-battleship grey initiatives that we're pursuing uh, in, in respect terms of to... democracy. Yeah, well, democracy promotion, mm. and, and is that part of the suite of things and along with infrastructure and comms and digital economy and things like that? Where might democracy promotion be in Pacific Step Up, dot, dot, dot? Sure. Uh, so I think in, uh, in response to your first question, uh, we have seen a very e effective underpinning of OSMIN meetings, uh, and uh, I've had the opportunity to participate in several, in uh, two incarnations, uh, in, uh, in a number of locations, obviously. We have seen uh, 
an underpinning of those with a very proactive approach to implementation, to a work plan that is actually the plan agreed between officials, uh, once the uh, secretaries and the ministers have left the room, agreed between officials to implement uh, the commitments. And I think the example that I gave about the Indo-Pacific mechanism is a very good example. So OSMIN, New South Wales State Parliament, August this year. Commitment between Prime Minister Morrison and President Trump on the 20th of September in Washington uh, to, uh, to implement the, in, to engage the Indo-Pacific mechanism, first meeting last week. Now, even from the point of time in which I took up the role as Australia's Defence Minister uh, in 2016, uh, I would not have seen uh, a pace of that nature uh, until we actually put the work plan process underneath how OSMIN has operated. Uh, so whilst uh, I think um, uh, I think it is often characterised as you know, a meeting of the ministers and the secretaries. What is really important to understand is that depth of officials' engagement between Australia and the United States is so significant, is so ingrained, uh, and is is literally the way we do business. Uh, and the, the statistic which sticks in my mind uh, from my previous role, uh, and I remember speaking at an ADM um, uh, event in Canberra uh, about this, is that across maybe 36 states of the US, more than 600 ADF officials, both uniformed and civilian, were embedded in the US system. And the numbers are proportionately similar in reverse. So what that says to me is this is not about who's standing up here. It's not about the secretaries and the ministers who are in the room. It's really about the breadth, but most importantly, the depth. Uh, and so I think we are, we are good at doing that. The trilateral, the TSD, you've spoken about the trilateral strategic dialogue. And again, a very powerful meeting in Bangkok on the sidelines of the EAS this year between uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, then Taro Kono, uh, and, uh, and myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we saw at APEC, in Papua New Guinea at the end of last year was a manifestation in the infrastructure sense of a partnership that also includes New Zealand about electrification in Papua New Guinea that is changing Papua New Guinea's electrification capacity from 13% currently to 70% under this infrastructure partnership. That is absolutely transformative. And so if you want to operationalise those, those things, then that is the way to do it. Um, in, in Fiji at the moment, uh, a number of, uh, of us with the ADB uh, are examining with Fiji, the government of Fiji, uh, the Nandi River project, which again uh, is a very, very important development for the people of Fiji and a priority of the government of Fiji. What our trilateral engagements, what our mini-lateral engagements enable us to do is to far more effectively engage in those discussions uh, than simply from, uh, than we have historically, and to produce outcomes. And so I think they are operationalised in that way. And part of what we do, most definitely across the region, is to engage, particularly in the Pacific, uh, around democracy, as you have, as you have put it, uh, both uh, within the parliaments, uh, but also within the public services. Mm -hmm. And that is a really important part of our work. And it is something which I think Australia has done proudly for many, many years, both from the um, employed side of my business, if you like, from DFAT, but also through Australian Volunteers International, through so many different organisations that you find uh, across the Pacific who are uh, who are helping, supporting, engaging with their public sectors, with their parliaments uh, on, these, on these aspects of democracy uh, that enable us to talk about values, uh, that enable us to talk about representative democracy. Uh, and with my other hat on momentarily as the Minister for Women, encourage those countries in which there are no elected women to <laughs> contemplate next steps as to what might encourage that diversity into a parliament. And uh, there's a lot of work that I am uh, enjoying um, bringing together between foreign affairs and, uh, and women in, those in that portfolio sense, uh, which goes exactly to that point. Thank you. Um, Drew has a microphone. If you could please raise your hand and he'll get your mic. And um, time is very tight, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry about that. So um, if we could keep them short and snappy. Right. 
I can promise shorter answers. Sure. Sorry. Oh, two quick, sure two quick ones from me. Thank you very much for the speech, Foreign Minister. Hello. Will Blasco from The Australian. Um, first question. The, um, it was a very um, optimistic speech about Australia's place in the world and especially the role of Western liberal democracies. There's been some champions of Australia joining or enlarging the G7, making it the G8 again. There's been champions for that domestically and internationally. I would like to know... Are you a champion of that idea? And, is, or, and if not, why not? And then the other one, a bit more of a bubble question, um, <laughs> just because I think it, it'll be asked or it'll be, it'll be in commentary tomorrow, this speech, beyond Simon being a very charming guy, um, to give a speech on, I mean, a really interesting speech on your worldview, the government's worldview, and especially China in Australia's future, to give that speech at the United States Studies Centre seems really pointed. Is it, or why, well, why can, give the speech here or not at another another forum? Uh, well, see, Will, you've missed the series. So uh, I had the opportunity to uh, to speak recently to CEDA uh, in Canberra, where uh, a lot of these points uh, were elucidated, and uh, I'm uh, enjoying the opportunity to, to develop those. Uh, and uh, you're right, an invitation from Simon Jackman is impossible to refuse. <laughs> Uh, but uh, not just there. I, I, last year, and particularly on the cyber and the uh, and the technology uh, aspects of this last year, I, uh, if I'm allowed to mention the name of other institutes and think tanks uh, here, the world won't fall down. Um, I accepted an invitation uh, with uh, with uh, Dr. Toby Feakin to go to Lowy and talk about uh, those challenges. So they're not um, they're not new views. Uh, but there are there are certainly uh, important views to articulate in the context of uh, of Australia's foreign policy. Um, as to whether Australia is ambitious to join other pieces of uh, of international architecture, uh, I think uh, th that is a matter governments will look at in time. But most importantly, those pieces of reg regional and international architecture which I have identified tonight, uh, ASEAN, its centrality absolutely the focus in our Indo-Pacific engagement. Uh, the EAS, uh, the IORA across the Indian Ocean, they are here in the Indo-Pacific. They are absolutely fundamental to how we do business. Interestingly, and I think uh, ASEAN is an excellent case in point, in the last two years, uh, I have had a series of very wide-ranging discussions with ASEAN counterparts, which as a student of the region over uh, almost uh, more than two decades in the parliament, I think would not have been possible 10 or 15 or 12, 15 years ago. Conversations about very, very serious human rights issues in Myanmar, an ASEAN member, where the countries of ASEAN working through AHA, the humanitarian agency, uh, are are also focused on addressing that challenge. And if you think about the fundamentals that brought ASEAN together, particularly the, the non-interference uh, aspect, um, that is a, a change, a change in concern about human rights and those humanitarian issues, but trying to work with a member at the same time to address those. I think that is, uh, that is very important. If you had asked, I think, many commentators 10 years ago, eight years ago, would they have expected in 2019 to see ASEAN produce an Indo-Pacific concept of their own? The answer would have been highly unlikely. Highly unlikely, if not no. And so those developments are really important in our region and it's very important that Australia maintains the closest uh, consultative, engaged partnerships with the uh, the members of ASEAN and then more broadly across the Indo-Pacific uh, to make sure that where we are in pursuit of a region that is secure, that is stable, that is prosperous, that is open, that is free, that we are working with the people we live with to achieve that. And so our focus is, is very much uh, in, in that. If a government was to choose to seek uh, engagement in a different piece of international architecture, ultimately that would be a decision for government and, of course, the uh, accepting body were it to be the case. Thank you.
Oh, oh we're back. Oh, Geraldine. I really did not shorten that answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> hello, Geraldine. Hello, hello, Marie. Hello, Minister. Um, look, I wonder if you react to, to this morning the quite a prominent column from the ex uh, uh, ambassador to China, Jeff Raby, uh, worrying as he has. He's not alone, of course, about the domination of the. Australia-China policy by the security military establishment. In his final words, it is time for diplomats to be put in charge, back in charge of our foreign policy on China. And others have called for a rearrangement of uh, arrangements inside the, uh, the cabinet. What is your response to that? I respectfully disagree with Dr Raby. Thank you. That is a short answer. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, thank you, Minister. Could I ask you specifically about one international institution, the WTO? Um, what does the, does the Australian government believe it will survive the departure of two of the three appeal panel judges in December? And could you outline what the government is doing to ensure that what I think is an important part of our in our interest to ensure that WTO continues? Uh, absolutely in, in our interest. And um, I'd like to introduce you, if he was here, to the other half of my tag team, Simon Birmingham, uh, who is very focused on those uh, those issues that you raise, Armin. And uh, he has been working uh, assiduously uh, at the same time as uh, prosecuting the case for the three recently uh, uh, agreed FTAs, as well as negotiating the RCEP and bringing the uh, IACEPA home uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, working very assiduously to uh, advance Australia's uh, case for uh, the preservation, but the reform of the WTO and the reform that brings it to a point of uh, contemporaneity that you would expect a world trading organisation to have. Uh, I think, uh, as um, as uh, as I've said uh, recently, and I think Simon has has also, uh, there are things that we are now trading whose invention was not even contemplated uh, at the point of development of the rules that underpin the WTO. Uh, so this is a significant task. Uh, I am not able to predict the outcome and I don't intend to try and second guess the work that Simon is doing in, in that regard. But I can assure you that it is an absolute focus of this government uh, and working with key partners to, uh, to ensure that we are addressing uh, those challenges in the most timely way that we can, bearing in mind that the, uh, the marker is a very hard marker. Former partner in crime. A former partner in uh, crime. Minister, thanks for your speech and the very clear calls on uh, importance of human rights, which I think is very consistent with comments you've made on regional events so far this year. Um, my question's about the future of the Five Eyes. You've talked about reforming institutions, and I'm interested as to whether you see a need or the possibility to reform that de facto grouping of democracies to make the conversation a little bit richer than just security policy. Uh, well, James, I think there's a, an assumption in, inherent in your question, uh, which I absolutely understand, because that is how it is uh, always characterised, that it is largely based in that historical um, uh, footing, if you like. But really, even in the amount of time that I have been uh, had the opportunity, the honour of working in these roles, uh, it has changed. Uh, it has uh, progressed, if you like. The conversations have progressed. The... Uh, characters around the table have changed from an intelligence-based only lead to involving defence ministers, involving foreign ministers uh, and developing the depth of the conversation uh, because the challenges that we face are so significant uh, and they are in so many ways shared. Uh, so uh, I'll take one relatively benign example, which is actually benign in conversation but absolutely diabolical in implementation, and that is threats to the democratic process in a number of, of, of our countries that we have seen, particularly by, uh, by cyber breaches uh, and, and cyber security threats. That is something which brings together a much larger grouping of people around a table for discussion than just intelligence officials because they are fundamentally important to our democracy. So you will, you, we see, I see, uh, every week uh, engagements across multiple platforms, multiple um, portfolio and policy areas which are predicated on that unity of the Five Eyes but which go much further than its um, historic 
verse. And I'm afraid that will be our last question tonight. We're running a little bit of out of, out of time, but our, our hosts um, get the last word. Thank you so much. Foreign Minister Payne, Professor Jackman, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Edward Johnson and I'm the managing editor for Bloomberg News in Australia. And it's my great pleasure this evening to offer the vote of thanks. At a time of rapid strategic change in the Asia Pacific, the Foreign Minister's speech was a timely update on Australia's role in the region. As the world's most China dependent developed economy and as a close strategic ally of the US, Australia's role is pivotal. As the Foreign Minister noted, our role in modernising the international system at a time when the international order is increasingly contested, our role has never been more important. And also at a time when, as the Minister noted, major power rivalry is intensifying, it's reassuring to see that we are such a leading voice for free trade. It's also reassuring to see such a level of pragmatism in navigating our relationship with China. The acknowledgement from the minister that we can and should be clear about our differences whilst working together in a beneficial way. Equally, I think we would all applaud Australia's commitment to upholding human rights. As Minister Payne said, where there is no challenge, there is no progress. Can I also thank the United States Studies Centre for facilitating this evening's discussion. The centre is Australia's leading institution for the analysis of American politics, foreign and economic policy, culture and history. And it plays such an important role in fostering a broader understanding of US society and the implications for Australia. With such competitive tensions in the region, and as the United States debates its role in world affairs, the work of the centre has never been as relevant or in more demand. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining this, us this evening and for contributing to such an informed debate. Please join me in thanking once again Foreign Minister Maurice Payne and Professor Simon Jackman.